Hello and welcome to Ember's Reading Room. Yes, we're still reading it. My Bedtime Book of Two Minute Stories. Edited by Rosemary Garland. Illustrated by Tony Escott and Sally Wellman. And boy, do I love these two minute stories. That are totally not two minutes. Yeah, we've timed it, people. Go back to the first episode. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe if I was a speed talker like those old FedEx commercials. Or Micro Machine. Mm-hmm. So, today's stories are Clarabelle, the Potty Muss by Anna Webb. First time we've seen Anna since, like, page 42. And The Present by Rosemary Bromley. The Potamus. I know they're hippopotamus, but the way it doesn't sound right. But let's continue. Clarabelle, the Potty Muss. Clarabelle is really a baby hippopotamus. But as she can't say that word very well, she calls herself a potty muss, which is easier to say. She lives at the zoo in the hippo park, which is like a great big garden without any flowers, but with a great big muddy pool in the middle. The pool is very important because all hippos love to have a mud bath, and they need lots of room to splash and roll about. Would you like to roll about and splash in the mud? I don't expect so, but Clarabelle loves to do that. One day, Clarabelle was feeling very excited because it was spring and the sun was shining and at last, after the long cold winter days when very few people came to see the animals, all the children were beginning to visit again. On this special day, Clarabelle was waiting for someone to come and watch her doing the special trick she had been learning for ages. To pick up a cabbage with her teeth, throw it into the air, and catch it in her mouth. Well, she waited and waited and waited, and still nobody came her way. Then she saw two men with a ladder and some buckets on a little cart, and they were coming towards the hippo park. When they got there, she saw that they had a big sign. But of course, as she can't read, she didn't know what it said, which was, Please do not feed the hippos. Anyway, the men came inside the fence, set up the ladder, and fixed the sign. They did a bit of painting, and then they went away again. Clarabelle was very interested in all this. She walked slowly over the grass toward the fence. And what do you think she found? The buckets of paint that had been left behind. Well, Clarabelle had plenty of fun with them. First, she put one foot in the green paint, and she looked at it. Pretty, she said, and in went another foot, and another, and another until all four feet were bright green. She did laugh. She laughed so much that she knocked the bucket of paint right over, and then she slipped on it and soon had a green stripe all down her back from her nose to her tail. She did look funny. All the green paint was gone then, but there was still the blue paint left. So she had a little roll in that as well and made herself into a striped hippo. Just as she finished with the paint, She heard the sound of laughing, and looking up, she saw, what do you think? A row of children, all along the fence, and all of them were laughing at her. How lovely, she thought, and she did her little trick with the cabbage, and all the children clapped their hands and laughed again. One little boy held out a bunch of flowers to Clarabelle, and she was just going to eat them when the wind scattered them in the air, and they landed on her back and stuck to the paint. She did look very odd. I suppose it was all the laughing children that made Clarabelle's mother come over from the other side of the hippo park to find out what was going on. And you should have seen her face when she saw Clarabelle. You naughty girl, she said. What have you done to yourself? Hippos are not supposed to be painted. How are we going to get it off, I should like to know. But she wasn't really cross. She was trying hard not to laugh as well. She gave Clarabelle a big push with her nose, and off they both went to the muddy pool. She washed her and washed her and rolled her in the mud, but still the paint stayed on. Nothing would get it off. Every day for a week, the mother hippo washed Clarabelle, but the paint would not come off. Secretly, Clarabelle was pleased, because every day the children rushed to see her, and she made them laugh, and of course she is the only blue and green striped hippo in the world. I suppose the paint will wear off someday, but be sure and look out for Clarabelle when you go to the zoo. You might be just in time to see her before it does, and she becomes an ordinary plain gray hippo like the others. The art is fantastic. 
Oh my god, that's a, that really is a funny looking hippo. I, I like the way the patterning came out. But feeding hippos, not a good idea. By sticking your hand out, no, bad idea. Hippos may look docile and friendly and everything like that. They're one of the most dangerous things you can run into. Just because they're vegetarians doesn't mean a thing. Those trucians are nice, they're very colorful. The texturing on the hippos is well done. And the way the paint looks on Clarabelle, very nice. Oh, and I just noticed in the bottom little corner there are a bunch of flowers in the two paint cans. So, in the two main pictures, you see all of that stuff ending up on Clarabelle. But down here, you just see the flowers framed by the two buckets of paint. The two pictures this time really do a nice job of actually illustrating the story itself, because you see the first stage where she's rolling about in the paint, and then you see her looking kind of, uh, ashamed? Chagrined. Chagrined, yes. Chagrined, as her mother pretends to be angry at her. I like how you read that line. It's so, it was so funny, it was delightful. I was like, I'm trying to hold back a laughter because I don't want her to have to read it again. Very nice story. No real point to this one, but it didn't quite feel as aimless as some of the others. Because basically the point was she wanted to make the children smile and laugh, and she made the children smile and laugh. And she ate a cabbage. And you may just be able to see her at the zoo. I've only been to one zoo in my life. It was a nice trip. Though we didn't quite get to see one of the animals we wanted to. Hold time of day and enclosures being large enough to give animals some room and some privacy. And now, the present. Jonathan woke up early. My birthday at last, he said, and he crept to the bottom of his bed and looked over the end. There were his presents arranged on his toy box. That was all his presents except the one from his mother and father. He knew that would not be there. For every year, mother gave it to him herself with a big hug and a happy birthday, Jonathan, dear, and that made it very special. Jonathan picked up a package. It was wrapped in red paper, and inside there was a big, bright, double-decker bus. With love from Granny and Grandad, said the card tucked inside. Jonathan wound up the bus and put his new toy onto the floor. Away went the new bus, with Jonathan dancing behind it. Out of his bedroom and across the passage and bump! Bus ran into the door opposite and stopped. Jonathan was bending down to turn it around when the door opened and his father looked up. Hello, young man. So you're up. Many happy returns of the day. My, that's a fine bus. Jonathan, called his mother. Bring your other presents into our room and open them here. And why put them at the base of his bed? As Jonathan raced to pick up his packages, he wondered excitedly about his present from his mother and father. How he hoped they had not forgotten what he most specially wanted. He began to think of that day two weeks ago when he had passed the shop with his mother. There it was in the window. Oh, look, Jonathan had cried, pressing his nose against the shop window. Oh, mother, I do so wish it could be mine. His mother smiled. Oh, do you, dear? Well, I shall have to speak to Daddy about that. But if you are a good boy until your birthday... Perhaps we may have enough pennies to buy it for you, but I can't promise. Jonathan jumped up and down. I will be good, mother. I really will, he cried. On the day before his birthday, he had passed the shop again and saw that it was not in the window. Jonathan did not know whether to be glad or sorry. Suppose someone else's mother had bought it. Suppose his mother had not been able to find enough money to buy it. Suppose he had not been good enough. And now as he carried his presents back to his parents' room, his heart thumped with excitement. Happy birthday, Jonathan, dear, said his mother with a hug. Here is Daddy with your present from us. The boy hardly dared to look as his father placed a large cardboard box carefully on the floor. Then Jonathan heard a tiny whimper, and over the side of the box came two small golden paws. Oh, you bought him! You bought him! yelled Jonathan. Oh, thank you! He knelt down and gently lifted from the box a tiny golden Labrador puppy. Isn't he the most wonderful dog in the world? cried Jonathan, joyfully receiving several wet licks. At breakfast time, after the puppy had some warm milk, he curled up on a rug in his box and went to sleep. We must think of just the right name for him, said Jonathan. Yes, we must. Pass the butter, please, replied his father. 
That's what we'll call him, cried Jonathan. He's just the color of butter. It's a wonderful name. Oh, this really is the nicest birthday I've ever had. Butter. Fun name for a dog. Also, fun fact, when we were doing this recording, one of our neighbor's dogs started barking. And I kept reading because I thought it was appropriate. I especially like the puppy in these illustrations. It is, like, cute. Super cute. What's really funny is the boy looks slightly cartoony compared to his parents. They look a little bit more realistic in the way they're done. And they also have that nice illustration of the boy crawling across his bed to get his presents and then a couple of toys underneath the bed. And I have a feeling the bus is a reference back to other stories. I don't think that Anna wrote any of the ones that had buses. Yeah, but who says that the authors of this book didn't talk about their stories? True. Also, this wasn't Anna's. This was Rosemary's. Hmm. So she very well could have. And pardon the dog again. So, cute story. The only thing is, this is always cute in stories. But in real life, usually not so much. Yeah, also the whole pennies. I'm like, well, nowadays you have to buy the puppy and a license and, of course, the food. So it wasn't just the cost of the puppy. It's the cost of the puppy, collar, leash, ID tags, and food at the minimum. Not even counting veterinarian care. So there's a lot of ongoing cost. Also Cause... ongoing responsibility. Yeah, because it's a life you're taking care of. And you must raise it well. Or in this case, him well. Also, it looks like this little tiny poem on this page. Just four lines. So that would be, I think, two couplets. I think a couplet is two lines. You know, a couple. Hmm. So I guess this would be one stanza. Hmm. There was a little squirrel who lived in the park who had a furry tail, like a question mark. Oh, that's cute. It is. I bet the puppy would love to chase it. Also, I bet this poem stanza to reason. Ember, are you okay? That hurt. Just, just a little. It didn't help that we recently watched an episode of MLP, so that kind of creeps right in there. Sorry, Ember. So yeah, very cute in theory. Not so much in practice, but still a cute story. And the art was nice too, and it's the two color artist again. You know, it flips back and forth and all. Pretty much every other story. So how close are we to the end now, Ember? Very close. We have three more episodes after this. Ooh. And then I have to find another book. Uh-oh. Good thing you have plenty. I still have lots of books. So this has been another installment of My Bedtime Book of Two-Minute Stories, edited by Rosemary Garland, illustrated by Tony Escott and Sally Wellman. Today's stories were Clarabelle the Potty Muss by Anna Webb, and The Present by Rosemary Bromley. Thanks again for listening. If you still haven't picked up a copy of this book, pretty sure it's still on Amazon for somewhere around the yard sale or library discard price that's written on the inside cover of my copy. Probably also a little bit better condition than my copy. Also, for those of you who haven't been following along with every single episode, you can go back and get caught up. It's not sequential. Each story does pretty much stand alone. And if you are all caught up on this series, uh, there are lots of other Ember's Reading Room installments of uh, books that can be read in one sitting. Also, there's a bunch of pop culture stuff over on the main section. And just because I always throw it there because, hey, I like shopping and saving money. So, uh, yeah, Ebates link. And the usual disclaimer, Amazon and Ebates are not sponsors of or in any way affiliated with Ember's Reading Room or any content of the Lux Analysis channel. Thanks again for listening.